Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined back for the third and possibly final time, uh, Mr. <laughs> Paul Wells. Paul, welcome back on the podcast. Thank you so much, Bart. And yes, hopefully the third time's the charm to finish this one up and wrap it up. <laughs> yes, and I say that in a good way. Well, I say in the Neil series, because we'll, we'll likely have you back on in the future, because you've got huge knowledge on um, multiple different things. But uh, pe people made it very clear in the comments. They were like, don't worry about the timing and how long these are <laughs> and the amount of parts there people people have enjoyed it we've we've now have the benefit of releasing two seeing the reaction and now we can do part three knowing that people are actually enjoying this yeah yeah and and um thank you everybody for for watching and listening so far it's it's really amazing to get this kind of reaction and um i'm, I'm just so thrilled that there are so many people that are so deep into neil peart that want to find out all of these cool things about him and um uh yeah i i i uh it's actually been interesting because we've gotten some really good uh comments and feedback on uh the first two parts and a number of people who um are vastly more knowledgeable than i am about this have pointed out a few things that we forgot um so i wanted to to kind of start by listing a couple of those things but by addressing some things sure. that uh that i wanted to talk about that um that i forgot or things that i didn't know about at all well, before and Paul, before you start into that, can I do a quick like housekeeping kind of thing? First off, Absolutely. if you've listened to part you if you haven't listened to part one and two, I said this before, you can jump in here and get into the DW era of of Neil's kits if you like that. Uh, why not? But also go back and enjoy those. Um, I also want to say quickly thank you to everyone for your comments, for watching this. It has been incredible. So many people are as as you said, I, I wouldn't say they're more knowledgeable than you, but I would say they are very knowledgeable. There's firsthand experiences with people who like played the kits that were won from the magazine ads and things like that, or the the right. like giveaways and things. Um, yeah. But real quick, before we get into this, I do need to go give a quick shout out. Um, so I have a Patreon tier that is fifteen dollars a month, and you get a shout out on the podcast. So I want to thank Mr. John Golden for joining up on uh, the fifteen dollar level where that's the upper tier and you get a shout out um, on an episode. He got a good one here because a lot of people will probably see this. And uh, he actually reached out and sent me a message and said, and we'd spoken before, but he said, um, you know how you mentioned and how he, he said, do you know how I, meaning me, mentioned in the last one, how drummers will always build themselves into corners. And I said, and I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. And he said, he sent me a picture of his drum set in a nice big room and he had just literally built himself into a corner and we had a good laugh and uh, it's, it's just what we do. So um, thank you to John. It really does help keep the show going. It helps uh, support the show um, on that note, because there's a pretty big audience here. If you are a fan of the podcast and want to join up at that tier, um, 15 bucks a month, it's kind of a cool thing because people can like, you can promote your like brand, your lesson services, your website. I will give you a shout out on the podcast. And then at the end of the of every single video on YouTube, uh, there's a little card or whatever that says like, thank you. And it's got drum shop names, podcast names. You can put your band name so you can promote whatever you want there. But um, for, for this time, thank you to Mr. John Golden for um, supporting the podcast. And uh, it really does help things. So uh, we appreciate it. So all that being said, Paul, take us right. uh, take us where you want to go, my friend. All right. Well, first of all, yeah, thanks, John, for your support. Um, so the first thing I want to address that a few people have, have mentioned um, <laughs> was uh, my not knowing exactly how to pronounce um, Crotale. Uh, <laughs> that came up a and lot. <laughs> it did, yeah. There were some, and, and the funny thing is, the funny thing is, is that so the comments, there was a, a wide range of interpretations of how one might go about pronouncing that word. So I actually got in touch with um, Eric Gross, who works at Zildjian, and he um, talked to a classical percussion specialist there, um, who uh, confirmed that it is pronounced Crotale. 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 So, yeah, Crotale. So, Crotale, Crotales, um, that is the pronunciation. Now we know. Okay, so let's see. The next thing um, I wanted to, to, to clear up, this is, these are little 
housekeeping things. Um, I mentioned that Neil, this is in the first episode, that Neil had got his first Wuhan Chinese symbol. He mentioned that he got it at Frank's Drum Shop. And I was confused and said that uh, that was in San Francisco. That was actually, Frank's uh, was a shop in Chicago. And so I checked the tour date listing, the tour date history, and um, it very much lines up with when you start to see that Wuhan in photos. Um, they actually played a three-night run um, in Chicago, January 6th to 8th of 1978. And the first um, photos you see where the uh, Wuhan China appears, and as I mentioned, it was initially, he mounted it on his left, um, are around that same time period, or maybe a week or so later um, into January of 78. Um, and also cool. that made me think about, boy, I'm not sure I could think of anywhere I'd want to be less on the first week of January than the city of Chicago. A lovely yeah. city, a really, really great place. But I remember touring there in February, and I think I'd never been so cold in my entire life. And it took me like yeah. a week before I was not cold anymore, even after we had, <laughs> were long gone from Chicago. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so well, that's so, and I will mention that there is a uh, full episode about Frank's drum shop with Rob yes, Cook and the right. history of it. And there's like gangsters and like you know giving mm. cops money to let people park out front. And there's all kinds of cool stuff in that one. So awesome! Uh, yeah, yeah, check that episode out for sure. Um, so something really important that I neglected to talk about um, is about Neil's the tuning relationship between Neil's concert toms and Neil's double-headed toms. Now, one thing to mention is that in interviews with Neil, he would generally refer to his double-headed toms as closed toms and his concert toms as open toms, meaning Mm. the bottom is open versus the bottom is closed. Um, So if you see interviews with him where he's referring to closed toms, um, that's what he means. He means his double-headed toms. So when he added the, 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 six, eight, 10, 12 concert toms to the kit initially because those sizes were six, eight, 10, 12. And then with Chromie, the, the racked, the, sorry, the double headed toms were 13, 13, 14, 16. He was able to just get a chromatic sort of like high to low from, you know, six, eight, 10, 12. And then the 13 double headed tom was lower than the 12. When he changed the kit, in 77 and started he he completely revamped the double headed tom sizes to 12 13 15 18 he suddenly now has two 12 inch toms the lowest concert tom is a 12 and the highest mm. double headed tom is a 12 so the, the what does he do he could tune them the same way that he had them tuned before where there was just descending notes going down but it seems that he really thought of the two groups of toms, concert toms, double-headed toms, as two different groups of instruments. Um, almost like, if you'd imagine this, if you think about a keyboard player playing a piano, now the white keys and the black keys are all part of the same instrument. They're the same voice. You know, you play the you play a chord on the sure. on the on the black keys, and then you play a chord one half step up on the white keys it's a different notes but it's the same sound i think he thought of the concert toms almost like a keyboard player would maybe have a piano here and a synthesizer mounted on top of the piano where you may have a middle c on both of them but they're drastically different voices and he would use them as such now sometimes he would do fills where you go down the concert toms and then go down the double headed toms but a lot of the time he was doing things where they were kind of utilized as separate voices so the point of this is that the 12 inch concert tom was actually tuned lower than the 12 inch double headed tom even though sort of the you know the the um the placement of them was to have them kind of go down like this they actually went down in pitch and then back up when he gets to the double headed 12. so i i think i mentioned that the the double-headed 12 and the double-headed 13 in Neil's setup um, all the way through, you know, the, the 80s and into the 90s, he had the double-headed 12, he tuned that drum really high. And even in the Farewell to Kings Hemispheres era, that's that drum's tuned quite high. Double The single-headed 12 up further to the left was tuned lower. So you would actually have the situation where 
I'm going to try to imitate the pitches. The four concert sure. toms are like ding, 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 ding. And then starting on the double headed toms, you have ding, 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 where the 12 is, is higher again. So sure. when he would do these descending fills from the concert toms to the double headed toms, he would actually skip the double headed 12. He would go right from the single headed 12 to the double headed 13 in order to get an actual downward, chroma- or not chromatic, but a downward descending pitch type fill. Um, and this is a really interesting thing. It's a really unique thing. And it's something that confused me for years. I would listen to his recordings, listen to his drumming, and hear pitches going up or down and assume that it was all sort of like, you know, logical to the placement of the drums. But it actually wasn't. And you have to really, when you listen to them, you have to tune in, you, you have to tune your ear to the sound of this very high pitch 12 having a very different sound than the concert toms. Um, the concert toms having a shorter sound and kind of more attack. And I don't know, it's it's a little hard to describe, but w- when you yeah. think about it and you listen to it, it's it, it makes sense. And, and a good place to hear it is towards the beginning of Cygnus X1, um, there's a section where he plays some fills where he he does some fills where he kind of plays them the first time on the concert toms and then plays the same fills a second time on the double headed toms. Um, mm. It's hard to describe, but I think fans no, know what I'm talking about. And I think they know yeah. um, the section of that tune that I'm talking about. And it's just interesting. It's, it's you know, different melodic possibilities that he had available to him. And it, and it makes things sound, yeah. it's a little bit, it reminds me a little bit of like drummers like Kenny Aronoff, Billy Cobham, and Gary Husband, who would set up multiple tom kits where the toms were in different positions, yeah. not not all, you know, yes. like 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. They would do like 14, 10, 13, 12, or whatever, you know, any combination so that their hands would go and maybe play things that were comfortable and conventional for their hands because the toms are all out of order. Everything sounds unique and different and new. So he had yeah. a little bit of that going yeah. on. Now, Related to this, I want to talk about the sizes of those smaller toms because a few people had asked about this. Um, so the concert toms, if you look at catalogs um, from the early 70s, mid 70s, you look at Ludwig, Slingerland, Gretsch, they all kind of had a standardized size for the concert toms, just like they did for rack toms. Like generally with any of these companies, a 12 is going to be an 8 by 12, 8 inch depth, 12 inch head. 9 by 13, 9 inch. That was kind of standardized tom sizes that I think really kind of came into standardization around maybe the 1940s. Um, so same thing with the concert toms. You have a 5.5 by 6, a 5.5 by 8, 6.5 by 10, 8 by 12. Those are the depths of Neil's concert toms, and that's for the Slingerland drums and the Tama drums, and also the very first, um, when he first ordered the Ludwig kit, the white kit, he, I think I mentioned this, he initially had ordered concert toms with it and then replaced them with double-headed toms. But he ditched the, the 12, basically, um, from yeah. the, the small tom array because now why have two? If he's going for double-headed toms all around, why have two 12s? Makes sense sure. considering that he thought of those at the time as the concert toms is kind of a different voice of instruments. So what's yeah. interesting about the the depths of those toms, so now he just has 6, 8, and 10. And Ludwig's catalog sizes for double-headed toms of those size, they only made power toms. So this is starting in the, um, I believe in the 1980 catalog, the standard sizes are 9 by 6, that's a 9-inch deep drum, 9 by 6, 9 by 8, 9 by 10. So all three of those would have been this, the same nine inch depth. However, Neil's drums were not those sizes. Neil, for whatever reason, requested shallower size double headed toms. They were still power sizes as we think of them, but they were not sure. the nine inch deep toms. Now, here is where things get confusing and, and get a little bit sort of contradictory. Um, so as I mentioned, those are definitely not nine inch deep toms, at least certainly not the six and the eight. Um, now we've gotten 
I, I had actually reached out to a couple of people, or you reached out to Bernie Stone on my behalf um, to ask him about yes. some of this stuff. Now, Bernie Stone worked at the Percussion Center of Fort Wayne and during this time period and had hands-on experience with Neil's drums. And the sizes that he gave were that it was an 8x6, an 8x8, and an 8x10, so all three drums being 8 inches deep. Blue Goose Classic Percussion has provided vintage drum restoration and sales online for over five years. They're pleased to announce that they will be opening Atlanta Drum Shop, a full-service drum destination in Atlanta this summer, 2023. Featuring new and used gear by all your favorite brands, Atlanta Drum Shop will be a true drummer support center and cool hang. And if you love Neil Peart and Rush, come play, not just take pictures, of their Neil Peart R30 commemorative kit, an exact replica of Neil's kit from the R30 tour by DW. And check out their expansive collection of DW Neil Peart replica snare drums and other memorabilia. As huge Rush fans, their goal is to share these drums with the world. Atlanta Drum Shop is opening to the public this summer, 2023. Join their mailing list to get updates at atlantadrumshop.com or find them on social media at Atlanta Drum Shop. And if you love vintage drums, check out bluegoose.com. That's B-L-O-O goose.com. And find them on eBay at Blue Goose Classic Percussion. B-L-O-O Goose Classic Percussion. Thanks to Blue Goose slash Atlanta Drum Shop for sponsoring this episode. Um, and one thing also to point out is that the 10-inch Tom had regular, uh, regular Ludwig Classic lugs, but... The eight and the six had Ludwig's sort of mini lug, a slightly smaller version mm -hmm. of their lug, which they used on smaller toms. Um, now, I also had reached out. I, I I was communicating with a gentleman named Alessandro Bianchini or Bianchini, who is um, an Italian drummer who has a number of Neil Peart replica kits that are unbelievably accurate and amazing this <laughs> guy awesome. has put so much work into detail and i mean it's it's phenomenal he has absolutely beautiful um replica kits he has a replica of the black chrome slingerland kit he has an amazing replica of the rosewood tama kit and he has an amazing replica of this white ludwig kit and the sizes that his kit has and, and he actually modified them. His his toms, the little toms, are six by six, seven by eight, and eight by ten. That's what he told me his toms are sized at. And when I looked at pictures of his kit, it looked th those little toms looked exactly the same as Neil's. And I think I gave mm. you a photo where I actually found a photo of Neil's those three toms just lined up on the floor when they were being painted next to Alessandro's three toms lined up just, you know, together. And they look exactly the same to me. So I suspect that he is closest, if not exactly on the money with the sizes of those drums. That's now, awesome. Yeah. There is yeah. more. There is more. So people <laughs> have asked about this too. Um, when Neil started the Hold Your Fire tour, he realized that he needed to have, he still needed the little concert tom voice for, um, mostly for the tune um, Red Sector A, which they were playing on that tour, because in Red Sector A, he's playing the back kit with the electronics. But at one point in that song, there's a little, a couple little licks on the concert toms, where he, you know, he, as I mentioned in the last episode, when he's playing the back kit, he still has access to play the little toms that are now sure. on his right. So he yeah. he added one of the um, one of those concert toms back initially, just the six inch concert tom you can see in all the concert footage um, from the Hold Your Fire tour. He's got the six, eight, ten double headed toms, and also just to the left of the double headed six is another concert tom that's there just for those couple of notes, and that has a CS black dot head on it. Um, the other toms of that kit have uh, clear Remos or clear um, Evans heads, depending on, he was experimenting with heads at that time. I find it interesting to some degree that he, he like, if it's going to be played a couple times, he will get that drum out. He yeah. won't modify it just to just do it on a tom. It is like, no, it because, has to be yeah. that. Yeah. At that point, I think he felt like I just can't get that sound. I can't get the articulation from a double headed Tom. It's got to be yeah. the correct thing. Um, yeah. Now, interestingly, for the next concert tour, uh, the Presto tour, actually the Presto album, 
they do a tune called Scars, which is a, another tune on the electronic kit. And it's, it's this amazing tune that has this amazing drum part, very complicated drum part, um, where he's using mostly electronic sounds, but he incorporates some of the acoustic sounds too. And what he actually did was he added back another concert tom. So now instead of mm. just a six inch concert tom, he has a six and an eight on the Presto kit. And I sent you a photo that's from the Roll the Bones tour book, but it's a photo from the Presto tour where you can see him playing the back kit and you can see the two concert toms just to his his right. And on that tour, on the Presto tour and album, he's got six, eight concert toms, then six, eight, ten double-headed toms, and then 10, uh, 12, 13, 15, 16, and the 22-inch gong bass drum and two bass drum, snare drum. There's another interesting little detail, and this is something that I did not know about. Um, I left off a couple of things in the percussion instruments. I think I, me I mentioned wind chimes. I think I might mm -hmm. have forgot to mention the bell tree. Um, this is all stuff he added around the uh, Hemispheres era. Uh, well, Farewell to Kings slash Hemispheres. Hemispheres, he adds a bell tree, which he uses just a couple of points during uh, the trees, the tune the trees, but that ends up in the kit. Um, he adds a couple of triangles, lots of wind chimes. Now, there's an interesting, funny little instrument that he adds. Late 79, they do a very short tour before they go in to record um, the Permanent Waves album. And he, somewhere along the line, found this very small gong. It's like, you know, maybe mm. like a 10-inch gong, like just a little like Chinese wind gong, kind of a, the, the sort of thing. Like, I mean, jazz drummers will recognize, like uh, Bill Stewart often plays like a little gong. He has like a little gong that he'll sometimes set up in the kit. So mm. this is something like this. So he put it up on, on his right-hand percussion rack, kind of just below where the temple blocks were mounted. You see in some photos from from September '79, um, he's he's got this little gong, and I don't know where he used it because that was a short tour. All I looked through photos from the Hemispheres tour and the Permanent Waves tour. This short tour in late '79 or in the fall of '79 is the only time he had the little gong. And I don't know when he actually used it. The only bootlegs from that tour are pretty low quality. I can't discern like you know where he might have used this little gong, but he had this little this little voice in there. Now, yeah, starting with the moving with the Permanent Waves tour, January of 1980, the little gong is gone, but it's been replaced by this little instrument that that some Neil Peart fans get very obsessive about, called a Burma bell, Burma like the country Burma. It is a, a little instrument that Zildjian made that is basically a little metal. It's probably made out of the Zildjian bronze, but it's sort of a pagoda-shaped thing that hangs on a little string. And when you hit it, it spins like this. Um, and then we'll mm. eventually... So you hit it and it has this metallic sort of... It's a little... It sounds very similar to a triangle, but because it spins, it has a sort of oscillating effect. So that shows up at the beginning of the Permanent Waves tour and remains on the kit through the Moving Pictures tour. So January of 81... Uh, sorry, January of 1980, all the way through December of 81. And that's the Moving Pictures... Mm. The, the Permanent Waves tour and Moving Pictures tour. Um, and then it's gone for this by the signals tour. There's no more Burma bell. Is that one that noticeable that you, you hear it on certain tracks and it's an essential piece of, yes, he you know, plays it kit. at, yeah, he plays it, um, in the beginning of, um, uh, closer to the heart. There's a part oh, wow, where okay. Alec, Alex starts the tune on, on uh, acoustic guitar and Neil plays his little melodies on Crotales. <laughs> and after he plays that, um, right before Getty sings, he hits a little ding. And initially, mm. when they did that tune, he he would play that ding on a triangle. But it, it, it looks like on the video for Exit Stage Left, um, he actually hits uh, the Burma Bell. He also used the Burma Bell a little bit at the beginning. You see him hit it uh, on the Exit Stage Left video um, during Xanadu, during the introduction of Xanadu, which is a oh, big, cool. like, kind of lots of wind chimes and you know, sort of sure. percussion effects. 
So, um, yeah. yeah, I think that's more or less it. I mean, there are a couple other things I can mention, but I do not want to run out of time. Um, so- no, and that's those are good overview things. And, and there's so many incredible comments that people left about about different things. And just like, I don't want to say one and then miss a bunch, but people yeah. one, one guy wrote in and it was great. I, I liked hearing this stuff. He's like, the Wuhan China's that you get actually in China are much, much, much better. And I and, and then the ones mm. that get sent here aren't. And this was this used to be the case. I think things have been more regulated, but little information like that about yeah, or yeah. he had to take it and get the hole drilled out in the oh. middle to fit on a traditional symbol stand. Oh, right. Now that actually that's something I want to bring up because a number of people asked about how did Neil stack his 18 inch crash on a stand above the 22 inch ride. And then also his Wuhan on a stand above the 20 inch swish and a few other like the back kit had a 16 inch crash over a 22 inch ride. So what Neil would do, that's just a standard straight cymbal stand. And what Neil would do is he his he or his roadie would actually use a Dremel and widen the, the bell hole on whatever cymbal was on the bottom. And they would just put mm. basically, you know, you have your the base of the stand with the tripod. And then, and then the base and a wing nut, and then another rod and a wing nut, and then the top part where the tilter is. So yep. between the rod and the top rod, he would just put the symbol there. He would put a felt on top of the part that you screw up, the, the sort of top of the middle rod, and then sure. enlarge in the hole and just basically use that as a symbol stand for the, the, the ride in this example, the 22 inch ride. And then the the top post would come out of that and then you have another another symbol stand another you know you can mount two symbols on one stand it's a very simple way of doing it now it's not simple because it it involves modifying your symbol it involves enlarging the hole possibly considerably yeah. depending on how thick your symbol stand is but remember in the yeah. in, you know this was neil using originally pearl then slingerland and then tama symbol stands, but we're talking about the 70s and 80s. And I think maybe those stands were not quite as thick as we're thinking, you know, compared to some now. So maybe he wasn't really having to modify it too much. But it just involves putting a felt on top of that sort of middle post that the symbol would rest on. And then the rest of the symbol stand comes out of the the bell hole. And then you can put another symbol on top. And that was the 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 sort of simple way that he uh, that he mounted two symbols on the same stand. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering the same thing looking at those pictures and it's like, that's what it looks like. I didn't know if it was some weird modified thing, but literally to just open it, yeah. s- put a symbol in the middle of a stand. But and I have some behind me that the older stands really were a lot thinner. They're obviously thinner, yeah. not as thin as a normal, like the little whatever post that comes out at the top that you put your symbol on. But right. it's not like today where it's, you know, a I don't know, inch round yeah. hole or something. You, but yeah, um, I think you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to do that with a DW nine thousand, you know, symbol stand or <laughs> no. something very thick like that, because no. you'd be you'd be enlarging the bell hole if your your twenty two inch Zilco ride considerably yeah. larger than it than it than it yes. nor, you know originally would be. So um, let's let's move on to the uh, to the DW era. Let's um yeah. let's get into this change. So Neil's using Ludwig. Neil finishes up the um, counterparts tour. Um, he does the Burning for Buddy album. Actually, on the Burning for Buddy album, he uses a rental drum kit when he for the tunes that he plays is Red Sparkle. Um, it was a there's a 12, 13, 16, and a 22. Um, when he records his tunes, he only uses the 13 and the 16, the 22. It's a Red Sparkle kit that he later gave to a childhood friend of his named Kit Jarvis. Um, and mm. that kit is actually, if it hasn't already sold, it's going to be sold soon. It was actually kit decided to sell it and it's being sold through one of the big auction houses. Um, interestingly, yeah. Neil, that kit was red sparkle, but for whatever reason, Neil had it rewrapped to black diamond pearl. So the color it currently mm. is, is black diamond pearl, but it is the same kit. So, um, Neil starts studying with um, a drummer named Freddie Gruber in New York City um, in uh, fall of 94. And it's actually, I mentioned to you, I think in the last episode, that I that I was lucky enough to get to meet Neil at one of the Burning for Buddy mm-hmm. scholarship concerts. And he was actually talking about, um, this concert was on a Sunday, 
And he was actually talking about how the next day, the Monday, he was about to spend that whole week studying with Freddy Gruber. He had heard about Freddy and wanted to study with him. And he was, you know, sort of anticipating that, you know, he didn't know what to expect and didn't know what, what this was going to be like, but he was excited to start his studies with Freddy. Um, sure. And Freddy, you know, this is all very well documented. People can find out a lot more than I need to say about this. But Freddy changed a lot or encouraged Neil to change a lot of things about his playing. And a, a big part of that was changing his setup. And he, I think also maybe the experiences of playing the Buddy Rich music, he got comfortable or kind of liked the idea of playing a, a four-piece style kit like Buddy played with the with the rack tom, a floor tom, and the ride cymbal kind of close on the right, but close to the rack yep. tom. And maybe he was inspired by that as well, but he changed the gear, changed the drum brand, but also really drastically changed his setup. Um, completely different, like really, I mean, it's still reminiscent in a way, but this is kind of the biggest change that we've seen um, to his setup. I mean, to me, this is, you know, at least as big as adding the rear kit with the with the electronics and stuff, but maybe even more significant sure. because this is his primary kit. This is his like meat and potatoes kit and he's changed everything about it. So um, one thing that is very interesting that just recently came out, I mentioned the Ludwig kit that he uh, gave to his childhood friend, Kit Jarvis. Um, Kit included a letter of sort of like proving provenance of this kit that Neil had sent him where he's talking about, basically Neil wrote him this letter when he was just starting to work on the Test for Echo album, which is the first album where he uses the DW drums. And he talks about the kit that he gave to, to Kit. Uh, the, 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 yeah, the kit that he gave to Kit. This is great. Um, <laughs> kit Jarvis. Um, and, you know, talking about how he had it refinished and, but he talks about the DWs and he actually says, and this is something I did not know, and I'm not sure anybody knew this, but apparently Neil did a similar thing before he switched to DW where he actually did a thing where he compared a number of drum sets again. Now, he very mm. well was very well documented in doing this comparison of kits when he switched to Ludwig in 86 is when he did that comparison. But this was one that he didn't really document. I don't. I can't recall any interview or any writing where he talked about, you know, he just switched to DW and he didn't really talk about, I mean, he talked about what he loved about them, but apparently according to this letter to Kit Jarvis, he um, tried DW's, his old Ludwig set and a set of IOT drums. Do you say AOT or IOT? I say AOT, you say IOT, potato, <laughs> potato. Let's all call right. the whole thing off. I'm sure. All right. So commenters, <laughs> go at us. Feel free to to to, to shame shame me for for uh, for pronouncing it wrong. Yeah. Aot. I think it's Ray. Uh, it's Aot. It's Ray Aot. Is Ray what I believe, Aot. But, okay. So like, Aot. Yeah. So so he play. He tested a set of um, wood hooped Aot drums, and he said that it was actually very very close between the DWs and the Aots, and that he decided Boy. instead. Um, he went with DW, but he he did order a uh, AOT snare drum, a wood hoop AOT snare drum, just to have one because he loved it so much. And he was really impressed with those drums, but he went with DW ultimately. Um, and I think, again, you know, we talked about with the Tama kit, with the, the Candy Apple Red kit, you know, having the thinner shells and the four ply Ludwig kits, Neil was, he wanted resonance. He was getting, he was sort of obsessed with resonance. The idea of like, how long can a drum sustain? How long can the tonality of a drum, I hit the drum and I hear a note and the note has length to it and, and, and has sure. depth of tonality that lasts. And I mean, DW definitely do that, man. I mean, DW, like yeah. those drums sustain, they really sustain. And that really was a big change in sound for him. And he started tuning the drums a bit lower at this point. So the the DW kit that he got um, was a red, the initial kit was a red sparkle kit. Now it's not a wrap, it's a lacquer. Um, DW do amazing um, sparkle lacquers. I mean, all their finishes yeah. are amazing. Um, yeah. But they, they do these fantastic sparkle lacquers. And... The sizes that he started out with, um, and there's a photo that I that I uh, included for you of the first promo shot 
um, that was taken. And this was, I believe, I think this actually taken before they even went into record test for Echo. Right when he mm, switched. Wow. Stormy background and the yeah, sand yeah. and stuff. It's, it's cool. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's a, he was a visual guy. He liked he totally. liked you know he had a sense of like let's let's make this photo look cool let's make the stage set look cool let's you know just there, there's a that's a theme you know everything everything looks good you know he doesn't put out a presentation that's half baked or not you know thought about so True. but if you look at that kit you can actually see that a lot of the hardware is kind of a hodgepodge of some dw but a lot of ludwig actually most of the symbol stand bases are ludwig if you look at that kit um, I think he didn't really have, and, and, and the DW hardware is like not really what he settled on, um, by the, by the, the, um, work in progress video, which documents the recording of test for echo and definitely the test for echo tour. He's got a full sort of like proper complement of DW stands and things. But at this point he still, he doesn't really have those yeah. yet. I mean, he's using that base still with the tripod. Exactly. That's There's right. There's no bottom. So he's. Seems like he's reusing it. Yeah. Yeah. They maybe sent him some stands and he didn't want to, you know, it didn't have a chance to modify them yet to take the, the tripod off. So yeah, that might be exactly what happened. That's a good point. So the yeah. size is the kit initially. So it changes a little bit for the tour, but the recording kit is a 16 by 22 inch bass drum. Um, he's got three rack toms initially, a seven by 10 an eight by 12 and a nine by 13. Um, there is a uh, 12 by 15 inch floor tom, a 16 by 16 inch floor tom, and up kind of in the old gong bass drum position is a 16 by 18 floor tom that's on kind of two stands. So mm -hmm. it's mounted up like that. And then on his left, a 13 by 15 floor tom. Now, these are mm -hmm. some different sizes for him. Um, he had been using, you know, a, a, a shallow 10 and you know 8 by 12 9 by 13 is certainly standard for him as are the floor tom sizes but instead of the second you know he he was using a 12 by 15 or you know 15 inch floor toms now for the last couple of tours so he continues that but just shifts things you know two floor toms that gets rid of the gong bass drums um and he changes the symbols around quite a bit too he still has the same complement of two 16s an 18 and a 20 as his crashes, mm -hmm. a 10 inch splash, an eight inch splash, but he moves the ride symbol in closer to him into that sort of like Buddy Rich type position of being, you know, almost right over the bass drum, just to the right of the 13 inch Tom. Um, he initially is mounting the eight inch splash off of the, the, like on a stand off of the bell of the ride symbol, but then quickly moves that to a new piece of gear, a completely new thing for him, which is a, X hat, a secondary hi hat to his right. Now, this was not a pedal operated remote hi hat. This is just a, a you know a, an X hat, right? That's that's yeah. what I I mean. Yeah. A remote hi hat is something that you control with a pedal. An X hat to me is Cable just a and, yeah yeah. An X hat to me I understand is just being you know a a something that's permanently closed or permanently open or whatever, but not controllable by a pedal. So that is a pair of fourteen inch. A custom Zildjian A custom hi hats. That's what he has initially as his secondary hats, and they're just to the right of the ride symbol. And then he changes the Chinese symbols around a little bit. Um, he gets rid of the 18 inch Pang. We never see that symbol again. And he gets a couple of new Zildjian Chinese symbols. Um, Zildjian make. I'm not sure they still do, but they they for a long time they're sort of standard. After the swish, starting in the 80s, they came out with a, a, a symbol that they called the China Boy. And they made the China Boy high and the China Boy low, um, which I think were just, you know, pitch designation, designations. I'm not actually sure whether or not yeah. they were a different profile. They may have actually been. It may have been maybe the low was less of a bowed sort of top and the high was sure. more bowed. Actually, I wouldn't be surprised if they were. And I think those were Zildjian's attempt at copying a Wuhan style China. And they were sharper sounding than a swish would have been, but they still had more sustain than you generally find from a Wuhan China. So he actually gets an 18 and a 20 China boy low and initially just mounts the 20 kind of, you know, it, you see, it's a little different in that initial promo photo 
that I sent you with the Ludwig stands yeah. and stuff. But what he settles yeah. on by the time he's doing the recording of Test for Echo is the the um, the twenty inch China Boy Low, kind of you know where the swish, where yeah, where the swish basically was. But but you know where the kind of you know, I guess where the Wuhan ended up being to the right of the, you know, just under the 18 inch crash, a little further to the right of the ride symbol and the X hat. And then he has mm, the Wuhan. Sure. Basically, the Wuhan kind of ends up back where the Pang used to be. And it's I always I never quite understood why he did this, because he continues to do the ride to the China, you know, with the Wuhan, those sort of offbeat things that we talked about in the first episode. But he has a much further you know, I mean, this is a tall guy with long limbs. You know, he now yeah. has to go from the ride past the X hat, past the 18, past the 20 inch China boy, all the way back here to hit the, the Wuhan. It's not a problem yeah. for him, obviously, because he still continues to play all of those parts as yeah. well as he always did. But it just it's much further away than it used to be, which is sort of interesting. Yeah. Can you explain now? Because uh Neil in my lifetime has been famously just like he's the Sabian guy. He's all Sabian. Oh. So obviously at this point though we're we're Zildjian Zildjian. and China's Okay, yeah. so still Zildjian at Sabian, this point. Sabian Sabian so. comes in a few years later. Sabian comes in okay. around 2004. Um Got yeah, we'll it. get right. we'll get well, to that. We'll, Sabian, yeah, the Sabian thing is a big deal. Um at this Got point it. he's still with Zildjian, still using more or less the same models except for that, that you know the changes to the Chinese symbol I mentioned and the add-on of the 14-inch sure. A customs. You know, another thing I should mention, he changed the heads. He he completely changed his drum head situation. He went with entirely Remo coated ambassadors on tops of all the toms and on top of the snare drums too. And I need to mention the snare drums in a second. Um, and the bass drums, uh, initially he was actually using the DW stock heads, which are the sort of clear coated, um, you know, the, the, the heads that are clear with a little coated ring around the edge, yep. um, which is a DW innovation. Um, he was using those on the bass drums initially. He, he eventually switched to Power Stroke 3s on the bass drums for the Vapor Trails tour, but mostly was just using coated ambassadors for the first two tours that he used those drums on. Completely mm. different, utterly different. On the snares yeah. too, completely different from what he was using before, you know, using clear emperors and using the CS heads. Um, with the dot on the snare and bass drums. Um, so snare drums, he also, I think, probably was incredibly impressed with their snare drums, which, I mean, he should be. They're impressive snare drums. They, at that time, had their deal with uh, Johnny Craviato, where Johnny was making solid uh, maple and other wood solid shell snare drums for them. And Neil got really into the the 5.5 by 14. Actually, now that I think about it, maybe it was a 5 by 14. Mm, I should know this, right? It's either a five or a five and a half. <laughs> Come on, DW fans, tell me which one it was. But it yeah. was a solid yeah. maple. He used that one a lot. He also had a six by 14 edge, a DW edge snare drum. Now, that's a famous snare that they make that is a combination of of, of wood and brass. A very, very heavy hmm. brass top and bottom where the bearing edges are with a, a strip of maple in or whatever wood in the middle i think you could probably get sure. birch or whatever would they offer but at yeah. the time it was maple now one thing that's interesting there's confusion about whether neil's kit was a keller shelled kit or made with dw's in-house shells because around 96 97 was when dw switched over to making their own shells in-house initially they used keller shells um but it was verified by a gentleman named john van ness and i actually found something that he wrote, I was looking through my computer, you know, looking through old files and things. And back in these days, I didn't like, you know, if you found something online, I would like copy it and paste it into like a text, you know, like a like a text yeah. edit file or something, you know. So I have all yeah. these like text edit notes of things that I found <laughs> on the internet. But this is something that John Van Ness, who used to work for DW, um, he confirmed that they were made, Neil's drums were made with in-house DW shells. They were not Keller shells. They were in-house. Interesting. So that's important. Very early. Very yeah. early in-house, yeah. But I think I suspect yeah. they were probably experimenting with that for a few years and probably knew yeah. what they were doing by the time they made Neil's drums. But I assume that all of the drums were standard collector series drums. Um, it wasn't until later that they got into their sort of very elaborate technology of different sort of ply 
um, directions. And I'll get into that stuff with the next kit. But um, um, another snare drum to point out is um, on his left, he starts using a three and a half by 13 piccolo snare drum that's mounted up on his left. And he also moved, if you remember, up until this point, the cowbell sort of tree, he's got a cymbal stand with a splash cymbal and um, his set of five or six cowbells has always been on his right, just kind of like next to the ride cymbal and next to the the largest of his rack toms. So he yeah. moves that. Now it is over on his left above, uh, sort of above the 15 inch secondary floor tom and just to the left yep. of his highest rack tom. Near the mallet, mallet cat territory. Exactly. Right, right. Near the mallet cat. Yep. So yeah, big changes here. I, I think that's everything. Um, DW eventually switching to all DW hardware. He's using a DW double pedal, a, initially a 5000 series double pedal, single chain. And then once the tour comes around, so initially he records Test for Echo with just the three larger rack, three smaller rack toms, 10, 12, 13. Um, for the tour, I think maybe once they start rehearsing, he realizes, yeah, I've been playing with all these toms all this time. In order to play the older music, I'm going to need at least one more tom. Now, DW mm. kind of famously, I think to this day, still don't really make six inch toms. Maybe they do now, but I know they didn't in that era. They The smallest tom they offered was an eight. Um, so I don't know if they refused to make a six, but he just went with four rack toms, seven by eight, seven by 10, eight by 12, nine by 13. So now he has four. And it's interesting because he starts to alter, you know, he, he can't quite play, you know, he went from previous to this, you know, with the Ludwig kits. I mean, he, each kit kind of has a few, you know, like one less Tom. But if you think about the yeah, Tom yeah. kits, you know, he's got four concert Toms, four double headed Toms. That's four, uh, sorry, eight total Toms to do fills on. And now he's down to, well, seven, if you count the 18 inch floor tom. So he has to modify a few of the things. Some of the stuff that he plays, he kind of has to modify the fills just a little bit in order to make it work on the slightly smaller setup. But he does, I mean, you don't notice anything. You don't, I mean, I know what he's doing differently, but all of the tunes still work. It all, it all sounds great with, with even with, without the six inch tom. Um, For the tour also, he modifies just slightly the back kit just a little bit where instead of one 18 inch bass drum, for whatever reason, he gets inspired and has now two 14 by 18 inch bass drums in the back kit. And I love this kit. And this is the only time that he did this um, because after this, he switched to all V drums for the back kit, but on the test for echo Mm. tour, and there are very few pictures of it. I only found a couple. There's one picture in a tour book and then There's another picture, and unfortunately, the picture in the tour book, you can't really see the front bass drum heads, but I included a concert photo that somebody took. It's kind of a grainy photo, but you can see the cool design of the front bass drum heads. Yeah, this is awesome. I mean, it is very, very different, but like, of course, you look at the initial like promo photo, and it's very stripped down, but you're right, like you said before, when he hits the road, things fill back out where, I guess in the promo photo, it seems like, Here's the DW stuff, but on the road, it's like, no, here's Neil. Here's what Yeah, we, here's this is the needs. full setup to play all of the tunes yeah. that we're playing. Yeah. So so yeah. he also, the snare drum um, is a uh, another 13 inch, I think another three and a half by 13. So it's sort of like a piccolo size snare drum that he has in that back kit. And he only uses the back kit on a couple of tunes on that tour, but it is cool to see those, those double bass drums there. It is. And it's yeah. neat how he like, Hey, he, he puts that piccolo snare up like so high, like they're yeah. like mounted up where you, you really don't see snares like that ever. No. They're always flat and right, like next right. to you. So it's pretty neat how he does that. It's yeah. I don't know why. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, he's got a floor Tom, he's got a, a, a electronic pad. He's got the mallet cat. That's all kind of in the position where somebody would put a snare drum if they were having a secondary snare. So sure, true. that's kind of the best position, but he is able to, play it and hit backbeats on it occasionally there's some some tunes in uh later albums snakes and arrows and then uh clockwork angels where he does some some backbeat stuff on those on on the little snare but mostly it's kind of an effect snare it's mostly like he just does some little kind of uh rudimental rolls kind of stuff 
Yeah, I mean, part of the setup too, I think, you know, with Freddie Gruber, he had switched to, at least temporarily to playing traditional grip and recorded the entire Test for Echo record playing traditional grip. And this setup in a way maybe also is a little bit more conducive to playing traditional grip on, even though by the tour yeah. and certainly by the next album and tour, he goes back to mostly playing matched. He has changed his style to this somewhat more circular way of playing. And I think this sort of the setup and and also having the ride here, I think it just lends itself to this feeling of of having a little more openness and not being as up and down as he had been before. Um, so I think yeah. the setup was also a reflection of that. Now, while we go, and someone mentioned this, and I don't want to have like YouTube comments direct too much of what we say, but someone did mention, uh, well, like we should talk about how each drum set sounded, and and I will mm. I will note, and I you know I'm saying this, and I'm. We were always trying to be like positive and stuff. It seemed like overwhelmingly that I love how people are saying what their favorite era was. I like Tama. I like Ludwig. It seemed like uh, overwhelmingly people liked. Maybe it was because it was their childhood. Maybe it was because what they grew up with. Oh, yeah. That they really liked those earlier Tama Ludwig um, eras. But. I mean, DW makes great drums. What are your thoughts about this era of drum kit compared to the earlier ones? I know, I mean, they're amazing drums and everyone has a favorite because it's the right time when they grew up. But what, what do you think? You know, you have to understand for me, the first time I saw them, the, the new album, I started getting into them in 86 and then 87, the new album that came out was Hold Your Fire, which is the first album with the Ludwigs. The first time I saw them was on the Hold Your Fire tour. It was the Ludwig kit. I'm always going to be very sentimental about those drums. I remember too when I when I first moved away from home and I first moved to the New York City area to go to college um, was in September '93, um, and it's really freaky that it's coming up on 30 years that I've been here. But um, I remember uh, in October '93, uh, Counterparts came out. And I remember driving around, driving back and forth. I went to school in New Jersey, driving back and forth between um, New Jersey and New York City, listening to counterparts in my car and seeing them on mm. that tour multiple times. So that's very, that's very sentimental to me. I'm very emotional about that period and about those records. So, you know, for me, yeah, I mean, I kind of, my favorite sounding drums are the Ludwigs. If, if That's just my personal opinion. But, you know, sure. the, the, the Rosewood Thomas have a vibe. Again, I think I mentioned this, like you listen to bootlegs from the Moving Pictures tour, the drums sound phenomenal. Those drums had a mm. lot of cut and really sat in the mix in a really cool and interesting way. And I mean, the Ludwigs sound beautiful, but you know, the DWs had a great vibe too. And the Slingerlands sound beautiful. The Slingerlands sound on, yeah, yeah. You know, the drums, the drum sound on Farewell to King or uh, yeah, on, on um, sorry, on Caress of Steel actually is phenomenal. The drum sound on Hemispheres is fat and wonderfully recorded i mean i don't sure. really you know i have my my favorite is based purely on sentimentality but all of his drums sound yeah. good i also i mean i'm getting into the vapor trails album you know for me when neil went through his personal tragedies i think like a lot of fans we just figured the band was over and we were never going to hear from them yeah. again and when they came back and made a phenomenal album and a very emotional album and then came back and toured. I was at the first show uh, in Hartford, Connecticut on the um, wow. is June 28th, I think, uh, 2002 on the, the Vapor Trails tour. And I was actually personally going through a very difficult personal time at that at that exact moment and, and went to that show. And it was an enormously emotional experience to be at that show. I was in the sixth row right in the center and it was like wow that's awesome it was very intense yeah. so yeah. i have a very sentimental connection to that kit too the red sparkle dw's that he used on the test for echo tour and the vapor trails tour and yeah you know he yeah. was playing so incredibly well on on the vapor trails tour and had it, it was just phenomenal to see him back in action again and to see the band making music again and to see that sort of spirit come back um, so yeah. I love that kit too. And I love the sound of that kit because it reminds me of, of that time and those moments. So, I mean, I think that wins out over any sort of like, you know, I'm not going to say like, oh, well, this kit had longer sustain than this kit, or, yeah. you know, the bass drum spurs are much better on the Ludwigs than on the Thomas or, you know, that's, eh, yeah. you know, yeah, that's very well put. And I do think that like, uh, 
there are sonic differences that people prefer, but like you said, it's it's what was going, what you were going through yeah. at that time. I grew up downloading videos of him playing. Really, it was the Ludwig's, you know, from that was before my time. But I would, you know, rip videos off of Kazaa or whatever LimeWire back in the day, <laughs> yeah, and then Kazaa. also seeing the <laughs> seeing the the Ludwig's was like that was my with Neil wearing that like he started wearing the certain kind of hat and stuff. It was like yeah. that's what I was growing up with. So it's it catches you at the right time. So I. I do enjoy totally. though reading what people their favorite time period and it, it it's very personal i think a lot of people got into him in the dw era too and i think a lot of people were blown away by the the later kits you know like particularly the time yes. machine kit i still see people on facebook groups about neil like saying that the time machine kit is like the ultimate neil kit yeah and i totally get yeah. that you know it's 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 a it's definitely the most elaborate kit that he ever had <laughs> Um, we'll get yeah. to that, but um, I wanted sure. one one last thing about the test for echo kit with the double eighteens. Yep. So one other thing he changed, he's still using the D drum drum pads, which had replaced the uh, the Simmons pads on the Presto tour um, back in nineteen ninety. But um, he also changes the Chinese symbol um, on the back kit. He, he used to have a Wuhan on the back kit. He changes it to actually one of those Zildjian China boy lows. I think it's an eighteen, um, but you can actually see there's a picture that I sent you. It's sort of a from the front overhead shot of him playing the test for echo tour kit and you can see that chinese symbol you can see it's a zildjian but it has that square shaped bell that um you know it's round but but it's it's a it's a wuhan style bell um so that indicates that it was a zildjian china boy um low well low or high but but i believe his sure. were, were were china boy lows um and then the vapor trails kit is basically the same Oh, he uses the, um, on the Test for Echo tour, he uses the edge snare through the entire tour. If I'm not mistaken, it's the edge snare. Um, on the work in progress video, he, you can see behind him, he has a whole selection of snares and it's actually interesting. I won't go through what he has there, but it's interesting to see, you know, to kind of pause the video at like certain sections where you can kind of see what the snare drums are. There's a there's a Pearl snare drum back there. He's got a Ludwig Superphonic. He, you can see that Ayot snare, Ayot. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can see that back there. You can see um, uh, uh, a lot of DW snares. There's some other DW snares on there that, you know, and, and he actually plays one of the tunes on, um, I think he plays the tune, um, resist with the pearl wooden pearl snare and he plays the tune um the title track test for echo with the ludwig superphonic um and he talks cool. about that much later when he's talking about his dw snares that he used to always have you know he'd always have his slingerland snare in the studio he'd always have his uh he'd always bring a metal ludwig he specifies that that he'd always have a metal ludwig snare in the studio with him now i don't know if he actually recorded anything on a superphonic but interesting that he had one and he always brought it with him yeah um but he eventually really settles on dw snares being his sound now on the vapor trails tour it's the same kit but the back kit this is where lauren wheaton starts working for him as his drum tech and lauren mm modernized a number of things um test for echo he's still using the akai s900 samplers um and storing everything on a floppy disk so this is 96 97 it's not that you know people were still doing that then but sure. he changes yeah. neil's electronic setup entirely and gets him using some proper um i think he starts using roland samplers that probably have some sort of built-in hard disk thing but i i remember reading about lorne um maybe in an interview or maybe spoke about this like having to go through he found this box of floppy disks um of samples and he had to go through and transfer all of them into like sort of a proper hard drive um wow just to have everything backed up for neil but he switched neil over entirely to a v-drum kit including v-drum symbols or v symbols so the entire back kit changes to a full sort of v-drum complement for the uh for the vapor trails tour including as i said including the symbols and the only thing i believe other than that that changes in the drum kit is um the bass drum he starts using a clear power stroke three instead of the dw coded clear and um he change he changes the um oh well he gets rid of the sydney pad that he's been using since the power windows tour and he replaces it with a dawes pad um, which is a much more advanced, you know, but a, also very small yeah. sort of trigger pad that he can fit hmm. anywhere. 
um this is a big this he kind of settles on his snare drum thing where he realizes that so they do for the vapor trails tour they do about half of the tour indoors and half of the tour outdoors they play a lot of amphitheaters and they start out that tour and then kind of end up playing in arenas by the end of the tour but then go back outdoors when they go to brazil for the first time so he kind of settles on using the dw the craviato solid maple snare outdoors and then preferring the six by 14 edge snare indoors. So that kind of mm, becomes okay. his, becomes his thing for, um, for that tour anyway. So, um, yeah. yeah. And I'm looking at your photo here. It looks like, am I not mistaken that on the 2002 vapor trails snares document? Oh sent, yeah. There's a, right. there's a Yamaha the, snare. Involved. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I almost forgot about that. So that's yeah. from a modern drummer interview. Um, when Vapor Trails comes out, he talks about the different snare drums used in the studio. And it's a very, very interesting selection of snares. Um, he said that um, uh, Yamaha gave him a couple of snares to try out, and he ended up loving them and using them on almost the, the entire record. Um, the main one being the Yamaha 7x14 Elvin Jones model snare drum, um, which mm. is very cool that Neil would yeah. use an Elvin Jones anything um so the elvin yeah. jones snare was a snare that had wooden hoops top and bottom but neil mentioned in this article that um he very quickly cracked the hoops um so they replaced them with regular uh metal hoops so hmm. about i think he says like seven tunes on the record or something like that or the elvin jones snare and then he also got a uh, five and a half by 14 yamaha bamboo shell snare which is a, a drum that they produced very briefly, but Neil got one of them and he used that on a couple of tunes. And then the rest of the album is um, a couple of different DW snares. Um, yeah. I think a, a yeah. Craviato on one or two tunes. Which it, we, we talked about it last time, but it's just neat again the, to talk about how he played that solid snare brand solid oh, right. brand snare and now he's using the craviata with D dw it just kind of works together it, yeah yeah exactly i you know it's i'm glad you mentioned that because this is a, a little correction from last time um somebody pointed this out in the comments um the solid the 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 piccolo snare that he used on um the presto album for most of that album i mentioned was coco bolo wood and i said that it was an african hardwood but it's actually somebody pointed out it's actually a south american hardwood so Thank you for that correction, um, expert expert of hardwoods, whoever you are. Um, <laughs> yeah. So let's see, we're at Vapor Trails. So um, the big switch for the next kit is, well, it's a different kit, but the really the big switch is his switch to Sabian. This is where he switches to Sabian. And um, he talked about um, using some Sabians at a rehearsal. Um, he had heard Sabians. He'd heard friends, of, drummer friends of his play Sabians and really liked the way they sounded. And they had um, a rehearsal. They did one concert in 2003 for um, the, uh, during the SARS epidemic or the SARS pandemic in Canada that kind of shut down Toronto for a period of time. Um, there was a big concert to kind of raise funds for uh, businesses that were hurt by that, I guess. And it was called, it's a terrible name, but it was called SARS Stock. Um, or at least that's what it <laughs> It's not became. funny, but it's like. No, I know. It's really, <laughs> I don't think that's what they called it at the time. I think it was maybe called the Concert for Toronto or something like that. I don't know. But, but anyway. That is better than SARS Stock. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's, yeah, that's kind of what it became to be known. Sure. So the, during the rehearsals for, for that concert, they only played like about eight tunes, sort of a short concert that they appeared at. But um, he used Sabian for the first couple of days of rehearsal and was just apparently blown away by how great they sounded. And when he put the uh, his regular Zilchins back up um, after that rehearsal and then it's, I guess, sort of the final rehearsals and then the gig. He was really um, apparently not that impressed with how they sounded at this point. Um, mm. Maybe he was just ready for a change. I don't know. But Sabian also yeah. apparently were willing to give him his entire signature line, which became known as the Paragon line. That's Neil's signature line of Sabians, which they still make. Um, and it was basically the sizes that he's been using, but a bit of a refinement. So... 16, 18, and 20 inch crashes, um, a 22 inch ride, eight and 10 inch splashes, 13 and 14 inch hi hats, 
a 20 a 20 inch Chinese symbol with kind of a square bell. Actually, maybe the 20 inch China has a round bell. I don't know. It's sort of a swish style China. And then for the first time, he found a company that, you know, I, I don't know why if, if he wasn't happy with Zildjian's attempt at recreating his Wuhan, um, he stopped using his Wuhan. He started using the uh, the 19 inch um, uh, Paragon Chinese symbol, which is in fairness, a really great sort of, you know, modern replica of the Wuhan style symbol. And these symbols are a bit different than what he, you know, the, 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 um, the hi hats I know have some sort of hand hammering and the bells and they're, they're, they're kind of a, again, a refinement of what he had before. And they have a very nice, they do have a logo on them. Unlike his Zildjian's, which always had no logo, which I know you asked me about, um, yep. the, the Paragons have this very subtle logo, this sort of like etched looking logo on them. Um, but they're striking looking symbols and they, they, they sound very, very great. I never loved the ride. He went with a heavier ride vibe than what his famous old, you know, Zilco 22 was. Um, I talked about that before about how the Zilco was a low pitched and, you know, a strong and bold ride, but still had some spread to it. But the Paragon ride is a lot heavier. Um, for whatever mm. reason, that's what he wanted to go with, but it's a little, to, to my ears, it's a little more pingy. Um, and dry than what I was used to hearing before. Um, but that's the big switch. That happens actually before he gets the 40th anniversary, the 30th anniversary kit. There's something to it about like, oh, I love my symbols. Like I remember as a kid having like a ZBT crash and I was like, this thing's great. And then you try another symbol and then you go back to your original symbol and it's uh -oh. like, oh. <laughs> you can't unhear that new right. symbol. So that's an interesting, I, I, Some we all know that feeling. You know, and it's nothing against Zildjian. It's sometimes it's just time for a change. Sometimes you're yeah, just, no, you just know, you try Zildjian. something else yeah. and you just want to try a different sound. You want to, you know, or you want to, you know, maybe want to work with different people or whatever. Um, I, I'm sure that part of it, too, was that Sabian were willing to actually give him a signature line, which Zildjian don't do that. Zildjian have artists design symbols, but they don't put the artist's name on them. Steve Gadd and... True. Um, you know, a number of artists have, um, you know, with Zildjian, these sort of symbols that they design, but they don't actually put the artist's name on them. Um, that's just yep. sort of always been their policy. And Sabian have happily put um, artist's name on symbols. Uh, I think Jack DeJanette was the first one that had a signature line of symbols with them back in uh, 89. Dave Weckl has a whole line, you know, Neil's line. So that's, that's, that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and one thing too, before we move forward, I, I just want to say that I I like the look of I like V drums. What's well, also interesting, Roland DW now together. That's pretty you know mm. what looking ahead there. But also I liked that they were the red V drums with the red drum set. It just all kind of went together really well and looked the the V drums have a depth to them to look like a it looks like a drum as opposed to a pad so that's that's a nice uh, aesthetic look it's funny you mention that because each subsequent kit he kind of gets more elaborate sort of shells added to the v-drums to make them look more like you know homogenous with the rest of the kit um sure and, and you'll see that the, the the next kit the um the the r30 kit so so 20 uh 2004 was the 30th anniversary of russia's first album coming out 1974 so they do a big tour the R30 tour. Um, they record an album of covers that they call Feedback um, and then do uh, the, R30, the R30 tour in um, 2004. So he gets a new kit for this. And this is when we start to get into some pretty elaborate kits with pretty elaborate finishes. So the base finish of this kit, um, all of the sizes are the same as what we had before. Um, he's still using a 22 inch bass drum that next tour kit has the 23 inch bass drum but we'll get to that um so oh i should mention another thing about all these dw kits is that the previous kits had brass plated hardware but dw's thing is they actually do 24 karat gold plated hardware so all nice. of neil's hardware yeah all of neil's hardware on these kits so far is actually 24 karat gold now he does some other things some other colors with later kits but these first two kits are 24 karat gold Oh, and they later start calling this kit the SS Professor, the Professor being Neil's nickname. <laughs> yeah, um, that's and, awesome. And yeah, so so the SS Professor, 
Um, the base finish is, is something that DW called Black Mira, which is sort of a, a black, but with I think it's got a little bit of sparkle to it. But they devised this kit with these sort of panel graphics. And Neil talks about being inspired by Keith Moon's kit, the Pictures of Lily kit, which is this famous totally. kit that, that Keith Moon had around 67, 68. So you can see the connection, you know, with these sort of graphics in each panel between the lugs. Um, and Neil uses graphics from various album art, you know, concepts uh, like the, the nut and bolt from Counterparts, the uh, rabbit and the hat from Presto and so on. And it's also kind of cool because the first time he goes back to a uh, man in the star um, graphic for the front bass drum head, which is the classic, you know, that he used from, uh, let's see, 77 until 83. Um, that's kind of a classic Neil logo. Um, so this kit, and I got to refer to my notes, is the first kit where DW start experimenting on Neil's drums with these different sort of shell and edge options. And I hope I get this right because I actually found a little bit of conflicting information on some of these kits as far as what the shell makeup was. But I think the essence of it is that the smaller toms, the 8, 10, and 12, were standard shells, but they had um, what... DW call an ESE, which is enhanced sound edge. Um, so the bearing edge basically on those drums is very, very sharp. And that kind of helps to um, uh, enhance, you know, Neil tune those drums very high. Um, and, and this is actually interesting because in the Test for Echo era back in 96, when he gets those DW drums, he's tuning them a bit lower. He doesn't tune them as high as he had been tuning, but gradually as that tour mm. goes on, they start creeping up a little bit in pitch, especially the 12. Um, and then by Vapor Trails, they're a little higher. And I notice if you listen to bootlegs of the Vapor Trails tour, as that tour goes on, those drums get higher and higher pitched. He keeps going back especially the 12, tuning it higher and higher till he really gets back to that thing that he had in the late 70s and through the 80s where the 12 is really high, which I was talking about before. So sure. with the SS Professor, the 8, 10, and 12 have the, the very sharp edges. Apparently the 13 and 15 are normal. And at this point is when DW start experimenting with what they call VLT, um, which is um, vertical low timbre. And what this means is instead of the shell being, you know, plies of, of, of maple or whatever wood um, in sort of, you know, with a grain going this way with sort of with the, the shape of the shell, they start experimenting with vertical plies where the, um, where the grain of the wood is going up and down along the edge of the shell or along the, the shape mm -hmm. of the shell instead of sort of left to right sure and they find that this is yep. this kind of gives the the shell an inherently lower pitch so the larger toms the 13 by 15 the 16 by 16 16 by 18 and the bass drum of ss professor have vlt shells interesting man they're they're thinking very much about what what goes where and not all it's all the same it's got to be all the same it's it's all and and I think Different. this is exactly the kind of thing that Neil loved about DW is that they were taking this stuff into their own hands. They were saying, okay, we're checking out how you tune the kind of sound that you want to go for and the way you hit the drums. And we're going to tailor these drums even more to your specific needs. You want these uh, higher drums to be higher pitched and cutting. Okay, we can do things specifically to those drums that we won't do to the other drums that will enhance that sound yeah. and and help you get that sound same thing with the lower drums you want more low end power and low pitch from these well we can do something to to get that and it gets even more elaborate with the later drums yeah this finish is for me growing up i was 14 i mean this is modern drummer you open it you're looking at it it's just mind-blowing and and mm. i think it's uh the later ones are as well but this one i think i see a lot of r30 ss professor uh, yeah. replicas. This one seems to be very like, well, Guitar Center well, released a run they, of... They did uh, actually. They replicas. made it... Yeah. yeah, well they were basically made exactly to spec. They made 30 of them. Again, celebrating Rush's 30th anniversary. They made 30 um, you know, identical 
SS professor kits, identical except they didn't have the the V drum kit in the back, but just sort of the front part of the. And and there are thirty individuals out there that are lucky enough to have purchased these kits, and um, they came with these sort of special commemorative drumsticks that have a special logo. And um, yeah, it's really kind of an amazing thing that they they actually offered this kit um, for sale. And another thing that they did after that tour was they actually sent the SS professor out on tour by itself <laughs> with Lorne Wheaton. He actually did sort of like a clinic tour, except there was no no clinic. It was just they they took the kit around to different drum shops just to show it off because, and awesome. these things were like very, very well attended. Drummers came out just to see the kit and to listen to Lorne. Lorne was with it, set it up and packed it up every day. But he also spoke about the kit and talked about what was special about it and talked about working with Neil and answered questions. And it's very cool. I actually didn't get a, a chance to uh, to see that, but um, but apparently it was yeah, really pretty cool. Really cool. cool. Um, so I think I covered everything. Yeah, V drums that the V drums had a little more shell. They built some wooden shells to kind of put the V drums in. And you can see that it gets yeah. more elaborate with the next kit. But you can see he's starting to want the kit to look a little more like, you know, I don't think he's trying to make them look like acoustic drums, but just so that they visually match the rest of the kit a little better. Same turret lug. It's interesting to see a yeah. V drum with a turret lug, which is the DW iconic. Uh, that's a whole history there. But but that's pretty cool. That's interesting. I think we're going to start seeing more of that as DW and Roland have merged. Yeah. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I know that that, Ro that Roland and DW are working on the electronic drums. It would be like, why, I forget the name of it, but it would be like, it's like wire, completely wireless electronic drums where there's nothing plugged in. And it makes me right. think, who would be the perfect guy if he were still with us to be testing and being the yeah. like, you know, the, the voice of all this? It would be Neil if he were here. I'm sure he would love what they're doing with the Absolutely. technology. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and I think he also just he loved to let them do their sort of mad scientist work and come up with any sort of idea. And then he would take it out on the road. He'd try it out. Or he also lived um, not that far from their factory. He lived in, in uh, by this point, he had moved to Southern California and was living, um, I believe in Santa Monica area, which okay. is um, if you get on the Santa Monica is not, far from the ocean and you can get on the pacific coast highway and drive up i don't know maybe 40 minutes or so depending on traffic to oxnard california which is um just sort of i think past malibu and stuff um uh where the where dw's headquarters are so i think he enjoyed sure. also being able to just you know pop on his motorcycle or in a any number of really awesome cars that he also owned and drive up there, take a drive up the coast. I mean, it's a beautiful drive. I've done it before. I don't know if you have, but it's, it's amazing out there and, and, um, and visit the factory and see what they're working on and try out some new stuff. I think that was also an attraction for him um, at a later point with DW that he could have kind of a close relationship being physically close to the factory. Um, the okay. next kit to talk about, is not actually a tour kit, but a kit that he referred to as his West Coast kit. So he became friends with um, a musician named Matt Scannell. I think I'm saying that right. Matt is the uh, front man um, for the band Vertical Horizon. And Neil and him became friends. They'd hit it off. And um, Matt had invited Neil to play on a couple of tracks that he was working on. He wanted Neil to play drums. And this was all happening in Los Angeles, and Neil didn't have a kit out there. His SS professor was in storage in the band's um, warehouse. They just because they have a warehouse where they have all their gear stored in Toronto. It wasn't in a budget to uh, ship it over, or maybe it was possible. But he spoke to DW about like, well, why don't I have a kit here? Maybe I should have a West Coast kit. So they built him a kit with the idea that it would just be a recording kit, and that kit had a. Um, a wood finish. Um, it's a tobacco sunburst over curly maple finish. It's a very beautiful um, finish. And it was, I believe, all VLT shells, maybe the higher drums. I, I actually struggled to find specific information about the shells. I remember at one point thinking that I'd heard that they were made out of birch because DW had started making birch shell drums available mm. in their collector series. <laughs> Um, but then I couldn't find anything about that kit being birch. So I could be completely wrong there. 
Um, I did find something saying that they were VLT shells, but I'm not sure if the smaller toms were. One thing that's different about it, it's all the same sizes, except the, um, the, the 8 and the 10, for whatever reason, just have a single lug with two tension rods attached. They don't have the double lug. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know if maybe they are slightly shallower sizes. But one thing that's important about this kit is that um, this is the kit where he kind of discovers the 6x14 VLT snare drum. And this is the drum that really becomes his snare drum voice for the rest of his career. This is starting mm -hmm. around 2005, 2006. Um, and he basically, every snare drum that he plays from this point on is a 6x14 VLT. So maple shell with the vertical low timber, the... the um, uh, vertical low timbre, sorry, um, the, the sure. vertical grain shell. And he just finds that this is the sound that he wants. This is exactly the sound that he wants. And there's some interviews with him where he's talking about this snare drum. And he says, you know, up till this point, I was bringing different snares into the studio and still trying things. I would still have my Slingerland laying around. I'd still have a Ludwig laying around. But once I got this VLT 6x14, I never used another snare on a recording again. And Man, I think that's significant. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And um, it is a great sounding drum. He has a fantastic snare drum sound on um, the first Rush album that he uses this snare. And in fact, the, the next Rush album is Snakes and Arrows. And he loved this West Coast kit so much that he actually had it shipped to uh, upstate New York. Uh, they recorded Snakes and Arrows in All Air Studios in um, upstate New York in the Catskills. And he actually had the West Coast kit that was supposed to be West Coast kit was shipped up to the East Coast to uh, to record this album. So there's lots of good video footage of them in the studio. There's actually a documentary made about the making of Snakes and Arrows. It's a really great watch. It's on YouTube. And he's cool. playing that, that West Coast kit. And um, the West Coast kit, um, yeah, like I said, I, I didn't really find any specifics about the shells, but he doesn't ever use that kit live. He has a tour kit for the Snakes and Arrows album. Um, a, a slight change with the symbols, um, not for the recording of the album, but for the tour, um, is that uh, Sabian came out with brilliant finish versions of the, uh, of the Paragon line. And he uses the brilliant finish. In fact, he's never really seen using non-brilliant finish paragons again. Um, he mm. used normal finish paragons on the uh, R40 tour. Or sorry, R30 tour. I always get those too confused. Yeah. But a big change with the symbol is it's not a change, but he adds a symbol. He he comes up with an idea of what they eventually call the diamond back Chinese symbol. So he basically designs another Chinese symbol that is a thin kind of like a, a Zildjian swish type profile with a regular sort of small bell, but he has a combination of rivets and tambourine jingles installed in this symbol, oh, cool. which is very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really unique sound and it has a sort of cool hissing sound, which is I think why they called it the diamond back because it sounds like a snake yeah. hissing. Um, you hear it totally. all over the snakes and arrows album and that stays with him through the rest of his career. He, continues to use a diamond back. So that goes hmm. over the 20 inch Chinese symbol. Um, he stacks it right on top of that. And then further to the right is the 19 inch Wuhan style Paragon Chinese symbol. Yeah. Um, another yep. big difference with the Snakes and Arrows tour kit is that this is where he starts using a 23 inch bass drum, which again, hmm. is sort of becomes his size. He uses a 23 with all of his kits going forward after this. Um, it's a, it's a size that DW kind of came out with. I, I assume they still offer it, but you know, the idea being, well, if you're not quite happy, if a 22 is a little too small, but a 24 is a little too big, this is right in the middle, literally. And <laughs> Go he just, he falls in love with this size and he talks about it in a drum magazine interview where he said that, um, he always felt that he liked the sound of a 24, but the best, but he liked the feel of a 22. The 22 felt sort of, you know, tighter, um, more, um, more finesse, quicker, you know, easier to kind of manage. Sure. But the sound of a 24 sort of reproduced better. And I think he found the yeah. 23 was exactly what he wanted. It was, it was the, the lower sort of 
you know, lower end that you get from a bigger drum, but still with the sort of facility the 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 that you can get with a uh, with a twenty two. Um, now the the Snakes and Arrows kit has a whole new finish again based on the graphics for the uh, Snakes and Arrows album. It's this beautiful. Um, I think they call it Aztec red. It's a beautiful, rich red finish with um, black hardware it's black um the lugs and and all of the stands the rims are all um black finish which is a very very cool look and then there's these sort of snake graphics um really great looking kit and this has um also a similar thing with um uh ese um you know the the sharper edges on the smaller toms vlt shells now apparently according to the notes that i found in um this drumhead magazine article uh which is this is you know that kit this says that all of the the shells were vlt shells they were all vertical low timbre shells um on all of the drums including the smaller drums but the smaller drums had those sharper edges now they did mention that the 23 inch bass drum has a uh a rounded edge similar to i think what you would find on an old ludwig uh bass drum well any old ludwig drum from the 50s or 60s they have the very rounded bearing edges and they apparently yep. were doing that on neil's 23 inch bass drum maybe to enhance the low end um so sure. that's an interesting change and uh as far as i know everything else yeah everything else is the same well the finishes in general you touched on it but just dw has such an incredible like paint department and the finishes are oh, yeah it's that's the big thing with dw era in my opinion is obviously the drums sound great they're very the technology is incredible, but the fact that it's going from logos and designs on the bass drum head to all over the drum set is like pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Cool. The, the artwork. Yeah, it is. Yeah. They have a ridiculously talented, you know, paint and sort of design team there. And, and, um, they came up with some really amazing stuff for Neil's drums, but a lot of their artists have fantastic looking kits. I, Jim Keltner has some absolutely stunning yeah. looking DW kits. So even back to the mid nineties, um, uh, when he was playing with little village, he had this really cool kit with these different sort of, you know, um, block graphics on it. And, um, Tommy Lee's always had great kits, you know, I mean, you, you mm -hmm. name it, they, you know, they they do these amazing wood veneers and things like that, but they do, you know, sparkle lacquers. They do these sort of yeah. um, designs based on, I mean, you name it, there was stuff based on kind of like skateboard culture and there's a lot of stuff based on hot rod culture as well, like sort of like sure. flames and matte finishes and things like that that are popular in the hot rodding world. They were inspired by that. I mean, it's really, really cool, a really amazing team there. And and I think, again, this is something that Neil just loved um, yeah. working with the, with these people. Um, so um, oh, one thing I forgot to mention about the, the previous kit, um, he switched from coded ambassadors on the toms and started using by for the, the SS professor, he's using the DW clear coded heads on all of the toms. And that's also something that he sticks with for the rest of his career is the, the you know, clear with the co coded ring at yeah. the edge um, on on the toms. Do we know, are those made by DW or Remo and then sold as DW? Or? They're made by Remo specifically for DW. That's my Got understanding it. of them. Yeah. yeah. Very uh, nice. Remo, Remo's factory is um, located also in California, in Southern California. So I think maybe, you know, there is easy communication there, or easy distributor situation there. Sure. Distribution. Um, the next kit really actually isn't a rush kit, but um, it's a kit used for a one-off thing where Neil actually wrote the song that's used for the hockey theme, the hockey theme music for, you know, hockey games. And Neil wrote that music and he, to record it and do this sort of documentary about the writing of it, he had DW make this kit that's known as like the hockey kit. And it's basically, you know, Again, his basic setup, but with this hockey theme setup where he's got all of the logos and the, the panels of, you know, in between the lugs again, he's got all the different logos of different hockey teams used in the kit, Very which cool. is really kind of neat. Yeah. So it's a white base with blue hardware, which is a really cool look, this sort of metallic blue. Um, I like the way that kit looks. And he also has, for whatever reason, 
um, DW flat based cymbal stands for the most part. It's sort of like a stripped down version of his kit. It's like if he was going to make his kit a little bit more basic, this would be the kit if you were going to like start a Rush tribute band that was just going to play in clubs. This might be your go to yeah. kit. It's super cool. And I, I speak with with absolute respect, like my next door neighbor, who's a good friend, Paul is Canadian and I've met a lot of Canadian people and they traditionally really like hockey. So it's cool that that oh, Neil yeah. is into this. It's not like a stereotype that's like, oh, we all don't like hockey. It's like in my experience, it's there's a lot of hockey fans. So it's cool oh, to yeah. see Neil going for it, you know? Yeah. And, and I grew up in Pittsburgh, which is a pretty good hockey town, you know, but but I yeah. never really got into it. So. Yeah, he. Th- this was something I think he was pretty honored to to be involved with it because it sure. seems like he was a pretty big fan. So, um, yep. the, the the next touring kit though, um, and this is really one of his most significant kits of all time. This is probably like the epitome, maybe to a lot of people, the epitome of his at least his DW era. I think for a lot of people, this is his most famous kit. But this is the Time Machine kit, which initially was built for. Um, the time machine tour which was a tour that lasted from 2010 to 2011 and then he also used it on the clockwork angels album and clockwork angels tour which is 2012 2013 and this kit is again it's the same sizes 23 inch bass drum 8 10 12 13 15 15 16 18 and then the v drums um, but visually, this kit is just taken, everything is taken up to an entirely new level. And um, so the music that they're writing, so it's interesting because the Time Machine concept was that they were going back in time. They 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 performed the entire Moving Pictures album on this tour. And the idea being that they were going back in time to play this entire record. But they also kind of went for this whole sort of like, H.G. Wells slash Jules Verne sort of steampunk look where they, you know, sort of an, an, you know, an an 1800s vision of what a time machine would be in this sort of like, I mean, the stuff is really well documented. Again, I think that fans who want to learn more about this can find out more than I know about it. There's interviews with Neil Ori's talking about it, but this became this whole theme of Clockwork Angels, which was their last studio album. And this sort of big concept album that takes place in the steampunk world. And, you know, if you want to find out what steampunk is, if anybody doesn't know, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot you can find written about it, but basically the idea is sort of like a vision of the future from the past. It's about how people in the 1800s visioned the future, like a hundred years or a hundred years. You know more from there. So they, they, it's basically sort of a pre electricity vision of the future. So um, gears and obviously yes, steam right. and there's exactly just yeah. things. So yeah. so yeah. all of that plays into Neil's kit and also all of the stage stuff that they set up for Getty and Alex and all of the kind of like set. This is this is one of their most sort of maybe the maybe the tour that they did that feels the most like a set of a movie or something like that. Um, because everything on stage was the, in this sort of steampunk theme and and it wasn't just like guitar amps and bass amps and things on stage. Everything was made to elaborately look like, you know, steampunk type technology. Um, sure. And the kit was a reflection of this. So um, as far as the shells, it's similar to what um, was in the Snakes and Arrows kit. But what I, f- what I have is that the... Um, the smaller toms up through the first 15 were VLT shells, but then starting with the 13 by 15 and then the 16 and 18, they used a technology called VLX. So as I mentioned, VLT is where the vertical low timber, timber the shell grain is vertical up and down along the shell. VLX is where it's actually staggered diagonally. And if I'm not mistaken, mm. I think that maybe Yamaha have made drums like this too, and maybe Sonar as well. No, Sonar use vertical plies, I think. Uh, somebody should somebody who knows more yeah. about these drum specifics should should tell me about this. But but yes, yeah, so VLX, the larger toms in this kit are VLX shells. Um, the bass drum is, a, a, like the Snakes and Arrows bass drum, is a 16 by 23 with a VLT shell with a rounded edge. Um, the V drums again are the same. The symbols are the well. The symbols are the same setup, but he 
get Sabian to make a special version of the Paragon symbol setup with um, these very elaborate graphics. Um, so again, Neil and um, the graphic designer has worked with Rush forever, a gentleman named Hugh Syme, who designed all of their album covers from their from their third album, from Caressa Steel on. He did all of their album covers. He did all of their graphic design work and tour books and all cool. of this stuff. He's an amazing artist. And they worked on heavily on getting this sort of steampunk look going for for this era for for the time machine tour and then the the clockwork angels album and they had all of these sort of alchemist type designs made up um and they they use these designs on the symbols and they had sabian figure out a way to print these sort of graphic designs on the symbols and they really look striking um, and he said it was it was difficult for them to figure out a way to to print these graphics on the symbols without altering the sound of the symbols. And I think they did a good job with that. But I do notice that the ride and the hi hat sound a little different to me when I I remember like mm. hearing them on the on that tour um, and feeling that the 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 ride and the hi hats had a kind of a different sound than they had previously. Um, sure. So that's, but that's something a thing now is they, they, they took that technology and I'm pretty sure now they release it as a, there's like art series and I, I will, you know, put in the description or insert a picture if I can, but I'm at drum shows. I've seen what would be almost mm -hmm. 10 years later. That's right. like 10 or 12 years later. That's a thing that is common now is they have like art that's on their symbols. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Well, maybe yeah. that started yeah. with this, with the, 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 uh, you know, time machine slash clock or angels like era symbol logo, symbol design that they that they went for. Um, you know, the kit has all this elaborate. The riser has these sort of elaborate sort of, you know, all of this sort of faux wood design, and it's a very very elaborate kit. And that and and there's all this again. You can you can see interviews with Neil and and with Dom Lombardi talking about how they designed this. They they found these um. Don Lombardi found these uh, these lamps at a hardware store that had this sort of gear looking bit, and they ended up finding out who the supplier of the gear little gear doodad was, and they ended up using that as part of the turret lug, um, painting it with this copper finish. So the the hardware I think is uh, copper plated or copper colored on this kit because again that's sort of more representative of that sort of steampunk look. Um, but otherwise, yeah, the show, I mean, he's using the same type of heads, the clear coated heads, I think it's around this period. Actually, you know what? It was actually before it's on the snakes and arrows tour. Again, Neil kind of changes heads a lot. He's experimenting with drum heads still at this point, a fair amount. I think he always used the clear coated heads, but, um, on the snakes and arrows tour, I remember he started using a coated ambassador X which is a slightly heavier version of the coated ambassador, 14 millimeter version, as opposed to I think the regular ambassador is maybe 10 millimeter. Um, yeah. so ambassador X slightly heavier, you know, more durable drum head. Um, I know later on he's experimenting a bit more with heads. Um, at a certain point, I don't know whether it's this tour or the R40 tour, he starts using um, Remo come out with a CS version of the Power Stroke 3. So it's a Power Stroke 3 head, which has that you know muffling ring um, around the edge, mm -hmm. but the CS version also has the black dot. I know he's using that on the R40 kits, um, but um, he may have started using that on the uh, Time Machine kits as well. I'm actually not sure. Sorry. But he's also um, back to a real kick on his back kit, no, as opposed to that's a V. That's, oh, that's actually a V drum wow. kit. Yeah, he. he but did, the shell that, got bigger. Well, okay. that started with the Snakes and Arrows kit when he extended the shells on the toms on the V drum toms. He also they they housed the V drum bass drum in what looks like a small like a fourteen by fourteen. You know, it kind of looks like a yeah. like a baby kick drum. It's actually a great looking. It, it looks really cool. Um, yeah, and it, it does, does look more like a drum. Um, but yeah, that's actually not a, an acoustic drum at all. That's just a V drum wow. and an acoustic type shell. Um, cool. So yeah, and and um, and he uses that for quite a long time. He uses that, you know, the Time Machine Tour is a long tour, basically stretched over two years, 2010, 2011. And then the Snakes, uh, the, the Clockwork Angels album, um, which is their last album. And um, 
the tour for that, which extended from 2012 to 2013. Um, so there's a lot of gigs, a lot of dates that he plays on that tour, and I think uh, on that kit, and I think he really loved that kit, and that kit really did sound very, very special. Um, yeah, and that's well documented. Yeah. Uh, there's a Time Machine live video. There's also a Clockwork Angels live video, and you can see that kit there. Um, so we get to the R40 tour, which is in 2015. This is their final tour, and this is where Neil actually plays two kits on the tour. It's two, you know, long concert, two halves. And it goes back in time. It starts with their most recent Clockwork Angels album. And they go back in time and play music chronologically backwards, going back to their first album. For the first half, he plays basically his current setup, the Freddie Gruber type setup. Um, and now this is an amazing kit with an amazing backstory. So um, DW have always experimented with different types of wood and they experiment with different veneers and things like that. And they're collecting woods from all over the world. And they find out about this log that's discovered in Romania. So this, this is incredible. So a, 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 a oak tree in Romania in the year 500, this is 1500 years ago, in the year 500 AD falls into a lake. And it gets sort of buried under like silt in the lake. And at some point, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, somebody pulled it out of the lake. I don't know why, but they discovered it and they pulled it out of the lake. And DW bought this giant tree trunk of oak and decided we're going to make a drum set out of this. And Neil is the guy, like, I guess they made a couple prototypes and Neil checked them out and was like, I want this. This is what I want for my kit. Wow. So they make both of the R40 kits out of this Romanian, 50, you know, 1500 year old Romanian bog oak. So oak is a, a very hard wood. And I've played, I, I owned a Yamaha oak custom kit for a while, which I loved. And they have a, oak has a unique sound. It's a, it's, it's a hard wood and it has a sharper sound to it um, than maple or birch. But it also has, it's interesting, it's sort of like sharp and warm at the same time. It has a sort of throaty warmth to it. Um, you know, Neil's drums sound like Neil's drums, but he definitely fell in love with this sound and felt that it was a very special and unique sound. Um, so because he's using, so they, they kind of designed the first kit, the, the sort of modern kit, which he uses for the first half of the, the show, the concert, around what the tunes are that he needs to play. And he discovered that he wasn't playing any of the rear kit tunes. So, you know, on this tour, so they eliminate that part of the kit. So it's really mm. just sort of the front of the kit. Now this is done, it, it looks a little bit similar to the SS Professor kit because it's black with the same sort of panel design and he wanted to go back to that. Um, it's a different yeah. black finish. It's actually, I wanna see what the name of it actually was. It's actually called Dyed Black Pear. And it doesn't have a sparkle. It Seems like the SS Professor had a shimmer it to had it. A, exactly, yeah, that had a slight sparkle to it. This is a, a a flatter finish, but it's. I think it was actually a very, 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 very dark blue, um, rather than just actual black. I think there was a slight blue tint to it um, that maybe on, only under certain lighting you would see. But it's sort of like that thing where like certain types of blue look more black than black if that makes sense um sure. people that are into yeah. clothes that wear like formal clothes a lot of tuxedos tuxedo you think of as being black but a lot of people that are really into tuxes and if you watch the james bond movies um james bond's always like you know a clothes horse um he actually noticed that like sean connery wears what they call midnight blue tuxedos which is it, it looks like it's black but when you look at it very closely you'll see that it's actually an extremely dark blue and it actually looks richer than just normal black would look like it's sort of a strange thing here i yeah so yeah, so cool. it's i think yeah. that this kit was a little bit like that but again john good at dw somebody tell me what this what this finish was and what you know whether it was like yeah. there was any blue in there because i'd like to know that um what I could not find was any information about the shells on this kit, uh, other than the fact that they're Romanian oak um, 
from 1500 years ago. I don't know whether they were VLT or VLX or what the edges were. I, I couldn't find that information online. All I could find was information about the wood. So again, if somebody can point us to that info, please put it in the comments or, you know, however you'd like to contact us. But uh, that's yeah. um, uh, that. So, so you could see some photos. There's actually a photo I included an overhead shot from the rehearsals for the R40 tour, where you can see that Neil has a few more drums and things on this kit. You can see that he's got um, the mallet cat set up and he's got his cowbell set up to his left. Um, those things he found once they decided on the tunes they were doing, he didn't need the cowbells and he didn't need the mallet cat. So he actually just ditched them. And you can see an overhead shot and a couple shots I included of, of the R4, R40 kit number one on the tour. And you can see that those things are actually, uh, actually eliminated. They're not in use. Um, same six by 14 VLT snare, uh, 23 inch bass drum. So we've gone back to the regular Paragon, um, brilliant finished Paragons. Oh, this is a change. He added a few extra sizes to the Paragon line. Um, so the Paragon crashes initially worth 16, 18, and 20. He adds a 17 and a 19 to those sizes. Um, for whatever reason, they decided to expand those sizes. So, um, on that kit, on both of the R40 kits, actually, he experimented a bit with between 16s and 17s for the smaller crashes, 18s and 19s for the bigger crashes. And um, I think I think he probably switched a bit around on the tour. But according to the to the um, equipment manifest in in uh, Modern Drummer, on the bigger kit, the 18 is replaced with a 19. And mm -hmm. um, I think also the the left sixteen was replaced with a seventeen. I think those I think those are the official changes. But I wouldn't be surprised if he kind of experimented a bit while on that tour. And then the yeah. secondary kit, the the kit number two that was used for the second half of the uh, of the of the concert, is basically a DW recreation of his old Slingerland black chrome kit. So we go back to six, eight, ten, and twelve concert toms. 12, 13, 15, 18 double-headed toms, two bass drums, um, although now instead of 14 by 24s, he's using 16 by 23s because he does prefer that. It's a um, signature, yep. Yeah, and he goes back to some timbales. He has 13 and 14-inch brass timbales um, that I believe are gong bops, which DW own gong bops at this point. Um, and mm. for the gong bass drum, DW make him basically this sort of like mini gong bass drum. It's like, I think it's only five inches deep, if I'm not mistaken, and 20, 20 inch head. That's what he uses on, you know, sort of the far right past the 18 inch floor tom. And he goes back to the old setup with the ride all the way, you know, just to the right of the floor tom with the, with the crash over it on the same stand that the cowbells over, you know, the exact same setup that he used in the 70s. Um, and he talked about how difficult it was to go back to playing that setup after having been playing the sort of Freddie Gruber jazz inspired setup for so long. You know, this is yeah. by this point, yeah. you know, to, I mean, he started experimenting with that um, in 95. I mean, Vapor, uh, Test for Echo comes out in 96, but I think they started recording it in 95 or at least writing those tunes. And that's when he started using that setup. So it's basically 20 years between 95 and 2015 that he's used the Freddie Gruber type setup. So you can imagine how yeah, awkward yeah. it would be to go back. Um, although you don't hear sure. that when you, when you watch the videos. I mean, I saw them multiple times on that tour. And I mean, he didn't seem to be having any trouble at all adapting to this old setup and no. doing both things, you know, simultaneously in the same night. Well, and it's interesting to look at the the finish. You, I, now, mm. after doing this with you for, you know, two hours or whatever, I'm used to seeing these wild finishes with all these panels and different things. Right. It's like you go back to seeing just the black chrome kit. Right. Or their their rendition of it, and it looks more, but it looks so basic. But it's like right, no, that's I just know, what a normal yeah. drum set looks like. I know it kind of <laughs> looks like somebody else's drum set. Um, it is yeah, exactly. it is sort of a, a a sort of inspired by the black chrome finish, but he does have black um, yep. hardware on that kit, so that gives yes. it kind of more yes. of a, uh, um, a, a a a a cool look to it. So um, they sure. call that kit he, he, the, the the name they give to that kit um, is El Darko 
which is kind of cool because you have chromie, you know, the chrome slinger yeah. kit being called chromie and then um, black chromie for the black chrome kit. And then this is El Darko, which is kind of, you know, because it's a dark finish kit with d- black <laughs> yeah. hardware. So they give it that, that name, which is kind of cool. Um, and the Tom heads, the double headed Tom heads are the, the DW clear coated heads. The um, bass drum heads now are the CS Power Stroke 3. On the concert toms, he actually uses clear Remo heads. I don't know if they're ambassadors or emperors, but they are clear. He doesn't go back to using the black dot heads, which I thought was interesting. He's using um, just a regular clear Remo head on those on those toms. And he goes back to using a set of chimes, an actual set of tubular chimes, um behind him for uh for xanadu um which is super cool to see him with that back back in the mix again i'm remembering too when i'm when i'm thinking about these pictures that um actually dating way back to the r30 kit is when he switched to starting to use dw9000 series bass drum pedals i mentioned yeah, with i noticed the, that with the, yeah, yeah with the test for echo and vapor trails kit he's using 5000 single chain double pedals um, but he actually switches um, to the 9000. This is around the time it came out, 2004. He switches to the to the 9000. But just for the bass drum pedals, he actually continues to use a 5000 for his um, hi hat stand for whatever reason. That's mm. what he preferred. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Neat. But but yeah, R40 is um, that's basically his last kit. I mean, he retires after this tour, and you know, I think actually kind of sadly we've gotten to the end of the series because that's the final <laughs> kit <laughs> yeah i didn't think it would ever end i was like there might be a part four but <laughs> no well, really though it's 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 a journey man and it's, it's <laughs> incredible and i like i said at the very beginning and i've said throughout i just think it's neat to put all this information in in one slash three separate video places you know what i mean one yeah. place where people can watch through and and see all of it and getting all the amazing photos from like Andrew Olson's website and all the information you sent me. It's just like uh, incredible. And the 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 overhead shots and the breakdowns and the modern drummer stuff. And uh, I will say that I I am a Rush fan, but compared to you and the guy and the guys and girls, let's be honest, probably guys who are <laughs> who are listening, uh, it's it's uh, like I feel like you can love Neil and be a diehard fan or you can just love neil and and enjoy rush but neil is his own entity if does that make sense like you, yeah you don't, for sure he, i mean he he is an icon drummer's he's a, drummer he's a true yes. icon and and you know he is a household name um i mean it's certainly i think the closest thing to you know what buddy rich and and you know you have buddy gene krupa buddy rich ringo Starr, neil peart most famous yeah. drummers of all time. I, you know, I mean, maybe to certain generation, Travis Barker, Dave Grohl is very yeah. famous, but not so much as a drummer. Um, John Bonham. More as a, yeah, Bonham. I mean, but, but, but Neil is, it's sort of an entity. And, and, and I think because of, you know, his lyric writing and his prose writing, um, also just such an interesting yeah. personality and, and has such an interesting story that um, people are really drawn to him and, and really fascinated by him and i think you know he was uncomfortable with a lot of that um because he was a very private uh person and um you know but but yeah i think people just you know it, it just seemed to be an organic thing that that people just are were drawn to the guy um and still are you know people still talk about him a lot and are really influenced by him and there are people that you know, I mean, we're going to get to a point where there are people who weren't even alive at any point at the, the same time as him that will still be influenced by him heavily. And, you know, you certainly have that with um, with Buddy Rich. I mean, you know, I have I have a friend who was born a year after Buddy Rich, um, but he can play exactly like Buddy Rich and is That's a huge, cool. huge fan of Buddy and massively influenced by him and still one of his very favorite drummers. And he was not even alive yeah. at the same time. And I think Neil will prove to be like that too. I think this his yeah. his influence and his legacy and and um, iconic, you know, contributions are just gonna gonna live on indefinitely. 
a really yeah. amazing body very work. Well put. And, and he's very well documented yeah. too. You know, I mean, we're talking specifically about the kits, but you know, if you go on YouTube, it's not easy. Uh, it's not hard to, to, to go to somewhere like YouTube and find a lot of video footage of him um, playing drums in all these different eras and playing all these different kits that we're talking about and playing all of the brilliant music that they wrote and played and also footage of him talking. And he was such an intelligent and thoughtful individual and could talk with, with such um, elegance about what he was interested in and what he was doing and what he was thinking. And there's great interview footage of him talking about music, talking about writing, talking about drums and design yeah. and things like that that he was interested in so thank god he was so well um well documented and well represented absolutely um paul before i let you go one last question because people are going to ask it and it's been asked and it's going to be keep being asked for the people oh, yeah. who made it this far oh. can you address the fly by night uh, yeah, Chrome yeah, kit yeah. That's in the video okay. versus what's on the, you know, it's on yeah, stage. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's confusing because Neil on the Fly By Night tour, an album, um, and the tour before it was playing Chromey, the Chrome Slingerland kit, which is 13, 4, 13, 13, 14, 16, 222s in a Chrome finish Slingerland kit. And we talked all about that kit in the f first episode. Um, when, when Rush were in Atlanta, that, so they, Alex Lyson, I believe, talked about this in an interview. They talked about, um, they, they, they filmed two videos. These were like before MTV, but bands were making promo videos for their songs. Yeah. They, made two they made a video for Fly By Night and Anthem, those two tunes. And apparently, according, I think to Alex Lyson, they filmed them in Georgia. And I looked up the dates. I, I'm not sure I have them handy, but they were, um, it was at some point early in 75, and they were on the Fly By Night tour, um, or maybe the Fly By Night album had just come out. Um, yeah, I can't find the dates in my notes. I'm sorry. Sure, but they fine. were in they were in Atlanta for a few days, so I assume it was when they were on tour, when they were down there, that they filmed this the, these videos. Um, <clears throat> now they were. I think it's significant that they were in Atlanta for a number of days because I think they likely had to keep their gear set up at the venue and then film these things during the day it's because I am 99.9% .9 sure that the drums Neil is using in the fly by night and Anthem videos. And also the guitars that Getty and Alex are playing are all rentals. And I think they were rentals where they tried to get something as close as they could to what they were normally using. They did find Neil a Chrome finish Slingerland kit, but this is a different kit than he was, you know, using at the time. It's a single headed kit. Um, I actually know what the sizes are. It's two rack toms and two floor toms and two bass drums. It looked like big bass drums, maybe a pair of 24s and maybe bigger, like 13 and 14 toms. I'm not really sure, but they're, they're concert toms in that same chrome finish. But I am absolutely almost 100% positive that these are not his drums because he was pretty well documented on that tour. Um, there's not a lot of photos from the Caressa Steel tour, but there are a lot of photos from the first album tour and the um, and the and the Fly By Night tour. And there is no photo, there's no documentation anywhere of him using this single-headed Slingerland kit anywhere except this video. And it was pretty common for bands to film a video and use whatever rental gear they could get their hands on. And to back that up. Um, Alex is playing a cherry wood finished Gibson 335 or 345. I'm not sure exactly what model, but a semi hollow. He didn't own a guitar like that until much later. He was playing a, um, a Sunburst 335 and a Gibson Les Paul in that era. Getty was playing a black Rickenbacker. You, every picture you see, he owned a black Rickenbacker and he also owned a Fender precision bass in those days in the fly by night and anthem videos he's playing a white rickenbacker it's it's not their stuff i think all three of them were renting gear on that on that day when they filmed those videos none of them sure. are using their own stuff so i'm i'm pretty sure i think it would be a remarkable coincidence if they all went out and bought entirely new gear <laughs> used them just to film that video and then never <laughs> played them again i don't think that's never used it again 
You know, I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I've had to do this. I, I filmed some videos in Denver a year and a half ago where we were, we were on tour and we were, you know, we, we were in between gigs. We went to Denver and filmed some stuff and we, I used the kit that was in the studio. I didn't use my yeah. own kit. I didn't, you know, I wasn't able to, you know, we just flew in, did that and flew out the same night. You know, we, we, yeah. that's very, very common. It makes sense. Yeah, so yeah. I'm I'm ninety nine point nine percent sure that single headed chrome slingling kit was not his, but a rental. Yeah, it makes the most sense, and I think that that is uh, that was a common question, but I think that that is the safest assumption. So, um, before we wrap up, I want to thank John Golden for joining the upper tier on Patreon. If anyone else wants to join, you get a bunch of bonus episodes. You get your name in an episode. You get at the end. It helps support the show and pay for the platform we use and pro tools and all this stuff. So uh, thank you to John. Um, I will say that everyone watching this, if you're this far in, go ahead and subscribe on YouTube because you would be amazed yeah. at how many people that's a thing on YouTube where I'm, I'm guilty of it, but you watch a video over and over again, you watch five hours of Neil content and then you just don't subscribe. It does help the channel. So go ahead and subscribe. Um, like I said, I'm very guilty of it, but hit subscribe and enjoy it. Hit the um, like button too. Be on hit the like button while you're at it yeah like just uh <laughs> give us a like so um paul man i mean this has been a journey i'm gonna miss you buddy this has been uh the since we started i've become a year older I'm, <laughs> my birthday was in there uh you've gone to london and performed it's yeah. the season has changed it's now warm outside it's it's been awesome man i know well i i think it's 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 appropriate for a uh, a prog rock band that that is notorious for um for very long songs and very elaborate trump sets <laughs> yeah. that it would take us this long to get through everything and again this is yeah. me i mean this episode was me trying to rush through the dw no pun intended the dw kits yeah. You know, and all of these episodes, I'm like just trying to get everything in and it still just takes forever. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, no, everybody, perfect. for your patience and and actually listening to all this stuff. And apologies for things that I may have forgotten and things that I may have left out. I tried to get the Burma Bell in there. Sorry, I, I forgot you about it that. until now. But, you know, there yeah. it is. No, that's OK. Um, and I will say real quick before we're like totally done. Thank you to Bernie Stone for sending over yes. a bunch of info. He almost sent so much great info that, like I said before, Bernie is going to be on the show again. He did his Stone custom drums, radio frequency, uh, Slingerland uh, drum shell machine episode, which was incredible. Mm. Bernie's going to come back on and has firsthand experience with um, the all of the stuff, painting shells for Neil, all kinds of things. So um Bernie will be back on and we'll get more info from him, not only about Neil, but like about a bunch of famous drummer. He's drummers who he has worked with. So, um, Paul, <laughs> one last time. Thank you for being here, my friend. I've thoroughly enjoyed our time together. And thank, thank you, you for so sharing much. your knowledge with me and everyone. So glad to. Thank you so much, Bart. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been really, really fun.